Danger Girl Spectacular Part 1. Welcome back, friends. It's good to see you. You're looking good. Have you lost weight? That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This week we tackle Part 1 of the three-part Danger Girl series, featuring Parts 1 and 2 of the Ultimate Collection, wrapped up by a review of all four of the McFarlane Toys action figures from 1999. This week I have a special guest, my beautiful wife, Andrea. Go ahead, say hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, that's better. I don't know what to say. Okay. Corgis are cute. I like Legos. <laughs> I sound like a child. Corgis are cute. I like Legos. <laughs> Andrea will be helping me out by lending her considerable voice talents to highlight specific lines of dialogue spoken by the heroes and villains. Hey man, 90% of the characters in this book are female. I myself will also be filling in lines here and there for better or worse. Who man, I hope you guys are ready for bad accents and impressions. There's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Danger Girl was created by J. Scott Campbell and Andy Hartnell in 1998, and still sees new stories published to this day, though through IDW and not Image Comics, and I'm not sure how much input the original guys get to have on it. The Ultimate Collection is cool overall, but the fact that Bruce Campbell writes an introduction for it makes it that much better. Followed by some words from J. Scott Campbell and Andy Hartnell, talking about how inspired they were by movies like James Bond and Indiana Jones, and how they worked to put those types of cinematic images into their stories. Glorious! So our first dangerous episode starts with the prologue, Prelude to Danger, where Abby Chase, world-trotting adventurer and treasure seeker, is being held captive in Costa Rica by a slimy goofball known as Donovan Conrad. After a botched attempt at stealing the gold-plated skull, Cuckoo Diego, I can't believe my eye, how could you even contemplate coming here? This whole exchange between the two of them, with Donovan, is back and forth, wanting to murder Abby horribly and make out with her at the same time. She gives him a punt to the crotch, and we as the readers start to notice what appears to be a countdown. Finally, the counter reaches one, and Abby's distraction goes off. She kicks the goons holding her into the alligator pool behind them. Donovan slips into a secret passage as more bad guys show up and start shooting at Abby. She hops the barrier and pitfalls her way across some alligators. She barely makes it across by the skin of her, uh... Pants? Aw, oh, damn. This never happened to Roger Moore. Thank you, sweetheart. Abby spots a jeep and Donovan is still sliding. Of which, when I was reading this, I thought to myself, how long is this slide? Turning the page? Pretty long, and I got a laugh out of that. Abby takes the jeep, and Donovan lands in a boat. They're off! Meanwhile, two characters, Valerie and Sydney, are circling the location in a helicopter, apparently looking for Abby, who is currently speeding along a cliffside road when more goons come around the bend, firing their guns. What's gonna happen next? Chapter 1 is what? There's a one-page recap of the story so far, and we cut to the Bahamas where, where Abby's friend, a dude named Duncan, is being waited on by a topless coconut girl while talking to a pineapple. On the other end, a Sean Connery-esque character asks if there's going to be any problems with Abby, and Duncan assures him that she always steers clear of trouble. Donovan is whooping it up, and Abby dives out of the jeep, spotting his boat as it caromes off the vehicle. Grabbing a spear gun, she fires and is dragged behind. Donovan is essentially Abby's Rene Belloc from Indiana Jones. Well, Mr. Diego, I'm afraid we too shall soon have to part ways. With Abby out of the picture, you're off to the pawn shop. Abby comes up from behind and clobbers him. Suddenly, Jamaicans start firing at the boat as it races up the, uh, side trench? I don't know what you call that. Estuary? Maybe not estuary. They hit a landmass and slam down hard. Ugh, get off me, Donovan. We're taking on water. We're sinking. Oof, I wouldn't worry, Abby. Your natural buoyancy should save us. The motor is dead and the boat starts picking up speed. Donovan gets the upper hand once more and Abby tells him to watch out behind him. He ignores her naturally and catches a boot to the face as his toupee flies up. Aw, poor Donovan. He's such a lovable goofball villain. Grip. I can't do this. Do it. I can't. Grab hold. Grab. <laughs> Grab. Grab hold, Abby. We're getting out of here. Abby takes the Russian girl's hand as Donovan comes to, just in time to go over the falls and explode. Cue the James Bond intro. Actually, we better not. Later, Valerie and Sydney are fighting over the TV. Abby looks on as the Russian chick settles the argument with a knife to the wall. Abby makes her case for leaving, and I appreciate that her butt is still hanging out. When another figure enters the room. Good evening, Abby. I am your host. You may call me Douche. Mmm, Deuce. Not a great name for a guy that has a Sean Connery lisp. He poses for a team fit-up. Oh. 
He poses for a team photo and gives a very familiar backstory, culminating in the fall of the Soviet Union and being called back into action with the formation of the Fourth Reich, the Hammer. It's time for team introductions, and Deuce is the voice introducing everyone, but I think I'm gonna have Andrea read them as the different girls. Take it away, Andrea! Natalia Castle! She's a former Russian intelligence agent and personal combat trainer. Her skill with knives is unparalleled. Sydney Savage! An extraordinary special ops agent from the land down under. Silicon... Silicone? Valerie! An extraordinary special... Oh. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going, I just let it record and okay. try to edit it. A computer and communications genius hailing from Oxford. Mario! And hopefully, Abby Chase. A scholar whose expertise in ancient civilizations and mystical artifacts would be invaluable to our cause. Remember these poses, kids. They're gonna look pretty familiar in part three of this Danger Girl Spectacular review. Later, they show Valerie is younger than the others through Hanson and Hercules posters on her wall, and the three Danger Girl members argue about whether they can trust Abby or not. Because all girls hate each other. I'm kidding. Abby overhears and has a chat with Deuce, where she agrees to join the team. All right, Deuce. I'm in. Smashing! Morning on the Danger Yacht. Deuce clues the team into a rash of robberies of priceless relics from around the world, and he tells Sidney, Natalia, and Abby that they're headed to Paris to figure out why a former Soviet weapons smuggler is now dealing in antiques. In France, Sidney's got an eye on the peach, as he's called, and Abby has stolen a disguise in order to get in close enough to the target and their informant to plant a bug. Jesus! Abby just knocked a snot out of this poor girl just to steal her outfit, which ends up being too small. What's weird to me is that she stole her stockings also. The Peach gives Abby a slap on the butt as she plants the bug and Sydney yells out, Abby, no! Don't blow your cover! I love this satellite shot. So the Peach eats the bug before he can name the man that he's working for and then asks the danger informant if he can read French and tell him what the menu says. Of course, it's very parmentarie. 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 Severe parmentarie. Mashed brains. BAM! The Peach and his minions open fire on the informant's men. He grabs the shield and they make their escape in the truck from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wanna go for a spin? Sydney crashes through a fruit cart to pick up Abby and the two race after him. The poor fruit cart guy just left to squish his banana. They catch up to the truck in typical spring break fashion. <sighs> That's that's supposed to be. She boots the trooper out and takes control as Abby rams the Peach's car from behind. Another minion leaps from the car talking about a lift and you know what's coming. This is partially based on James Bond after all. Ah! Abby exits the tunnel where two heavily armed helicopters wait for her. Chapter 2 Previously on Danger Girl. On the Danger Yacht, Valerie and Deuce have lost contact with the team. The helicopters are taking shots at Abby in the convertible when she takes matters into her own hands, hitting the booster and launching the car into the air, and ejecting to the safety of the other helicopter. Wreckage rains down and Sydney swerves to avoid it. Abby struggles with the other shooter who cracks her in the face, and suddenly she's falling in space, coming to a soft landing on the Ark of the Covenant. She gives a cheerful farewell to the riflemen here, which I have censored for your innocent eyes, and the second helicopter goes up in flames. The truck is busted and the peach got away, when out of nowhere a helpful Frenchman pulls up in a truck and offers to help out. Back at the danger yacht, Natalia gives Duth an... <laughs> Back at the danger yacht, Natalia gives Deuce an update and tells him she doesn't trust Abby. And he tells her to meet them at the rendezvous. Our helpful Frenchman drops the pair off and shockingly requests nothing in return from these lovely ladies. But there's more here than meets the eye. Switzerland, the home of the Switz. Sydney and Abby sit in a ski lodge, awaiting their contact when Speak of the Devil enter Johnny Barracuda. Obviously based on Bruce Campbell. And no, I can't even begin to attempt that voice, so you'll have to settle for mine. So many snow bunnies, so little time. Johnny gets his own intro, gives the snow bunnies a pat, and sits down to business when he's suddenly struck by Abby sitting across from him. Faster than Peppy Le Pew, he's hitting on her before Sydney deals out the assignment. She and Natalia will run ahead while these two show up to the party later under Johnny's alias of Uter Frumpenpuff. Uter drops the guard a tip and tells him, eh, don't spend it all on one gas mask or bomb or whatever. Abby's got a dress that leaves no Nothing to the imagination, and it did not register to me until 
a number of pages later that this is actually Natalia in disguise as a waitress. She clues Abby into where the Peach is staying, who is currently having a meeting with the twins, Cain and Abel. On the sidelines, we've got Kid Dynamo and Mr. Giggles. Kid Dynamo obviously being inspired by Tattoo from James Bond. I can't tell if Mr. Giggles is a robot or a cyborg. At that moment, Kid Dynamo just decides he doesn't like the Peach and tears off down the stairs in his direction. The same direction as Uter, who's found himself yet another lady friend to buy slippery nipples for. Johnny sees him coming and throws out a foot. Not very undercover of him to do so, I would think. Instant recognition and hatred flood Kid Dynamo, and we're given a flashback sequence of their history together. Meanwhile, upstairs, Abby encounters a guard watching the Peach's room and uses her feminine wiles to gain access, telling him that she is a surprise for the Peach and that, You know, once I'm through with him, I'll be all warmed up and ready for you. Look! That's a little unfair, though. He's a more handsome fellow than what she's about to encounter. Cue the Well of the Souls music, as inside, Abby finally encounters the ancient shield they've been after. She begins to translate the inscriptions as Johnny gives her a heads up that the peach is on his way. Eh, danger stood the danger, babe. Where does she turn? What does she do? Hmm, I thought you'd never show up. But after all, good things come to those who wait. Chapter 3 Last time, another page recap, which I like more than just having a page of characters awkwardly speaking dialogue that rehashes what happened last issue. Switzerland, home of the- oh right, I did that joke already. Johnny Uder Barracuda has apparently moved on from the slippery nipples and is all over some martinis now, shooing Sydney away when Kid Dynamo clobbers him from behind. Meanwhile, Abby is upstairs working those danger curves on the peach. Now, I must warn you, they call me the Manimal. Boy, are you in for a treat. You like? Me like. <laughs> Abby drops the corkscrew into the tub and drops the peach with champagne on the back of the head. Meanwhile, downstairs, all hell is breaking loose as Sydney yanks out her blip. Where was she keeping that? Abby goes to the window to retrieve an attache case and gets changed. <laughs> Another person recognizes Johnny Barracuda and takes aim just before they're pinned to the wall by Natalia, hurling butter knives. This is the part where I finally realized it was her. And here we have to take a moment to address this. The art in these pages is absolutely phenomenal. Campbell renders women in anatomy with a masterful precision, and far be it from me to criticize him, but at least in this series so far, the action lines and movement in some of the shots are lacking. The second panel is good, but that first one is rough. We needed another pose for Johnny. I mean, I understand. These pages are covered in art, and some things aren't going to get as much attention as others. Even the movement of some of the cars in the earlier chapters, they didn't have enough speed lines for my taste, or, you know, whatever, to show that they were moving at high, high speed. Still looked great, it's just my one little criticism in a sea of outstanding artwork. Moving on! Goons burst through the door as Abby takes cover. She takes some out with the chandelier and dives out the window on the shield. The timing on these three panels are wonderful, and that laid out pose in the snow, I laughed. Johnny is hurled through a window and the pair jump onto a snowmobile to make their getaway as hammer soldiers fire at them. They're safe, but not for long as ski soldiers chase after them, exchanging fire. Another goon leaps on the snowmobile, fighting with Johnny, who kicks the dude off just as a flare gun goes off. It hits the top of a mountain. Avalanche chases them down the mountain and they go off a cliff into a lake. They swim to the surface and head for a nearby cabin. At the danger yacht, Sydney and Natalia update Deuce and it's mentioned that they'll find Johnny and Abby through GPS, which in 1998 they had to add an inset box telling you that that means global positioning system. FYI means for your information. In the cabin, Johnny has apparently already gone full caveman. He sidles up to Abby and the two start getting pretty close when Sydney bursts through the door. Sydney leads them through the snow and Johnny compliments on her waiting Humvee. Um. Do that again. I don't. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Caveman. Uh, yeah. I was going to try to say some stuff in Australian to, to kind of get me into the feel of it, and now I just sound southern. It's too southern. I don't care. Thanks, Captain Caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Caveman reference. <laughs> The rash of stolen artifacts has increased around the world, and the danger team believes they know the m next most likely place the thieves will strike. 
Enchanted Eddie Owen, creator of Enchantment the Congregating, a Magic the Gathering type card game who owns a significant collection of mystical artifacts. Chapter 4 One final recap, a character moment with Abby where she recaps her impressions of the characters and questions whether or not she can do the job. Natalia comes in and they have a moment where tough guy Natalia makes peace finally with Abby and asks her not to tell the others about it. Suit up! Maximum danger. The hammer villains start junking up Eddie's home looking for artifacts and he indignantly marches up to Major Maxim. Your insolence has exhausted my patience. I love Major Maxim. I don't know what his deal is yet, but he's very Darth Vader and Doctor Doom and any other major villain. On the Danger Yacht, there's an exchange between Deuce and Agent Zero, hinting at some cryptic backstory between them, and it looks like Deuce has dropped a file for him. Back in England, the Danger Team kicks in the door to Eddie's house and it appears to be completely empty. Jeez, Valerie's backpack makes her look like a Ghostbuster. They snoop around and Abby finds a book on Atlantis, depicting the resurrection of Atticles. Atticles. Hey, I got that right the first try. Atticles, the armored. So oh, I didn't get that part right. Atticles, the armored warrior who conquered Atlantis. They find Eddie unconscious on the floor nearby. He comes to facing any red blooded male's dream. Gad Zeus! Gad Zeus? I thought it was Gad Zooks. He bolts up, bragging of his courageous fight against their flamethrowers and chainsaws, and leads them to a secret room that the Hammer soldiers couldn't find. Inside lies a golden helmet reflecting villains from behind! Instantly, a firefight breaks out. Major Maxim punches through the wall and grabs Abby. She fires a shot through his tube, breaking free as Sydney lashes him with her whip. Abby fires away at Frankenstein's chest, and he hurls Sydney across the room. This made me laugh so much. Dumb cops. Grabs the helmet! Major Maxim tries to curb stomp Abby, and Natalia throws knives into his back to distract him. Immediately, a white freaking ninja comes out of nowhere and pins her arms to the wall. I love this panel. Johnny gets an idea and they reflect it by making the frame an exclamation point. Storm Shadow bolos Abby's legs as she makes off with the helmet, smacking the guy that was previously on fire to the ground. I love running gags. Interaction between Johnny and the ninja tells us there's still more backstory and making us feel like this is a lived-in world. Johnny dives at him, coming up short and getting stomped unconscious to the floor. Major Maxim is outside calling for his destructo nod. That's Sydney, by the way, if you couldn't recognize her. How how she became unconscious, I have no idea. Ninja Dude has the helmet and Valerie is taken hostage by the German chick that I don't think they ever named. She gives them a five count to surrender as Maxim rams the house. A beam falls on the frown line and Maxim begins pushing it over the cliff. You won't, uh, die, Americana. German babe takes aim at Abby and at the last second, Natalia dives in the way to take the shot. She falls to the ground in slow motion as the house breaks in half. Ending in a literal cliffhanger. That's it. Come back next time for chapter 5. Woo! This was an endeavor. I hope you enjoyed Andrea's 100% accurate accents of the world. She'll be back next time to help me finish this trade-off. Let her know in the comments how much you love and appreciate her efforts. Thank you, sweetheart. As for me, is there anything I learned from this comic that I can apply to my own? The sheer creativity in the design and layouts of the frames is something I should really start to consider more. Playing with unique angles and punching up the fun. Also, the casual way they work in characters having history is really awesome. And I'll have to remember that when I'm writing in the future. But that's it for this episode. Come back next time for part two. And don't forget to check out bonus commentary again. There was a problem with the audio, but I believe the sales pitch for best movie ever still shines through as we review that 1998 classic, Deep Rising. Link in the description below. Until we meet next, if you wouldn't mind liking and sharing this video and subscribing, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me, it helps out the channel, and it helps you get more videos. All right, that's it, thanks, bye. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs>